Welcome to our morning service here at Caronqua Chapel at Shiki Point, Texas. I'm Pastor James Rose, and I pray the service will be a blessing and a help to you. Hello? Hello. Okay, I just want to be sure somebody's here. Um, I thank God for Easter. To my thinking, it is the greatest holiday of the of the uh, of humankind. I was thinking of the word for it. Uh, because it's the dividing line between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm trying to get my tablet put back in my uh, <coughs> passage. I should have done this earlier, but I didn't. There we go. Uh, personally, I think they started the usher, who is the dating system that we're according to the Gregorian calendar. There's other calendars that different places in the world use. Uh, the Jewish people have a, what is it called? Uh, what calendar they have? It, anyway, it, just the Hebrew calendar. Yeah, the Hebrew calendar. It, it, uh, they list as the time that they started counting, and I forget what the date is today. 57 something. No, it's like almost quite 6,000. Uh, but uh, the earth, and by the way, somebody says, oh, you know, we don't want to study prophecy because, yeah, I mean, they talk about prophecy for years. Uh, I started out with under a man that was very versed in both the church where the church is and should be, and uh, what uh, prophecy says. So I thank God for I grew up in that era when men really studied the Bible. Somebody this week in our study said the greatest, the largest Christian denomination in the world might be called ignorant Christianity. God says in His Word, "Do not be ignorant, brother." So He wants us to know His Word, but. Today, people are not studying the Word of God. We need to study, especially, we're, Lord willing, in May, we want to start a series on prophecy and leading up to what we may well see the end of this dispensation. Now then, dispensation is both the way God deals with people and a time period. It's not just locked into a time period, but uh, there, it's a, how God deals with We'll, we'll look at some of that when we get into Revelation and study the churches, the things which have been, things which are, which will be. Well, have been is God's creation. Uh, what are, <laughs> what it is, is the church age of today that began. There's some mysteries. In, he, in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, if you read through it, it talks about a mystery down there toward the end. Well, there are many mysteries God has revealed. A mystery is not a thing that you only reveal to certain select people. Uh, there are groups that talk about the Bible code. The Bible wasn't written in code. It's written to be understood and read and believed by God's people. One fellow said years ago, he said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Somebody answered him back, said, God said it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> so that's true. Uh, the Bible wasn't written in code. Now, it was written in many ways that the world did not understand. Even today, the world does not understand the Word of God. So we need to, we need to know what it says. The greatest event of history is the resurrection. So I think probably uh, resurrection Sunday should have been the dividing line between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, what's the difference? Uh, somebody, well, they were saved by keeping the law in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. Even before the law. People could be a people of faith. And so, what was the difference? They're looking forward to the promise of redemption. God gave the promise of His redemption to Adam and Eve. So from the beginning of the first mankind, God gave a promise that I will send someone that will conquer Satan. What do we look at today? We look back at the cross and the resurrection as the fulfillment of that. As uh, uh, 
that we now know that God sent a Redeemer, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The, uh, uh, the very uh, factor that Jesus died as a man. Death literally took hold of him. He didn't just pass out. He didn't just swoon. He didn't just uh, go to sleep. He died. He rose again the third day to prove that he was God and that he could fulfill the promises he made to save us. So without the resurrection, we have no hope. So it's the greatest event of history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some years ago when I was living down at Sargent, uh, Tom Brokaw, I think it was, had a two-hour, I believe it was, special on the resurrection. And he had men of every denomination and group come and express their views. They were leading uh, priests, they were leading rabbis, were leading uh, evangelical ministers and all this and that. And I listened to the whole thing. And uh, basically, the majority did not believe in the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They had two ministers there that were very clear on the death, the burial, and why of the resurrection. One of them was David Jeremiah. Yeah. 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 Uh, what is it? Uh, what's the name of his program? Turning Point. Huh? Turning, point. Turning Point. Thank you. Turning Point. Uh, and I forget who the other one is. Charles Stanley? I'm not sure who the second one was. But there were only two, I remember, in that whole broadcast that really believed in the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And I thought that was tragic. Here you have men that are supposedly ministers of the gospel from around the world. Men that are leaders. And uh, many of them said, well, they believed it was a spiritual resurrection. Some even followed the Jewish thing. Well, actually, the disciples took his body away and uh, to prevent uh, people from uh, the, the, getting that. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Those early disciples, all but one man, died a martyr. And that was John, the revelator, John the apostle. Every one of them died a martyr. If they had stolen that body, do you think they would have given their lives for a fraud, for a falsehood? Hmm? Think about it. Would you be willing to die for a lie? I think if you had any sense in your head, you wouldn't. No, she were a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> I know, I'm bad. Bad to the bone. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is often called the resurrection chapter. It also clearly defines what the gospel is. Led a singing for an evangelist one time, and he preached on uh, short skirts and smoking and I don't know what all. And so about Thursday of the week, he said, Boy, I'm really preaching the gospel this week. I said, You haven't even touched the gospel this week. Mm -hmm. He said, Well, you don't believe what I'm preaching? I said, You haven't touched the Bible this week. Boy, it upset him. He said, Well, if you weren't so backslidden, you'd understand I'm preaching the gospel. I said, No, sir. Let me share with you what the gospel is. Now, he was an older preacher, and I was a young man at that time. And but some, Young people are... Yeah, sometimes they're dumb and sometimes they're gutsy that they'll do what nobody else has the courage to do. And most times it's not that we have courage, we're just too dumb and not realize we're going to keep our mouth shut. Well, sometimes it's good that we don't. Mm. All right. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Paul's saying, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel to you, which I preach to you, which also you receive wherein you stand, by which you're saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I received. And here it is, folks. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Throughout the Old Testament, it was promised that he died. Throughout his ministry to his 12 disciples, he kept telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. They're waiting for a deliverer to come, a redeemer to come to just take them away from the political system of the Romans and it reestablished the Jewish political system. That wasn't why he came. Somebody said, well, he came to establish his kingdom. And I hear this from preachers that ought to know better. 
that he came to establish his kingdom, but when the Jews rejected it, then he had to go to plan B, that he delayed his kingdom. Folks, he did not delay his kingdom. He knew he was coming to die, coming to die. Without his death, there would be no salvation for any one of us. And so he must die, according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, he had some that's there. And it used examples, for instance, of, of uh, Jonah, as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, and so will the Son of Man be. So he gave that. And then, here again was the proof of the resurrection, beginning verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Now Cephas was that one evidently on the Emmaus Road. Probably he and his wife were coming back that day. And uh, they ate with him, and then he went and met with uh, what was then the twelve, but now the eleven, because Judas wasn't there. After that, he was seen of five hundred brothers at once, of whom the greater part remained to this present. In other words, to the time of this writing of Paul. But some are falling asleep. Now, he used the expression falling asleep. That's a term used of a Christian dying. An unsaved person is not referred to as falling asleep in, in this sense. He's talking about a Christian dying. Some Christians, some believers, those who trusted Jesus have died. But the majority were still living. And after that, he was seen of James. We believe that was his half-brother. And he became the first pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And so, and uh, after that, of all of the apostles, uh, those that were his ardent followers, he had 120 in that upper room in Jerusalem that, that was the start of the church there. At the last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. He said, I'm the least of us. Paul never had big man syndrome. He never thought he was the greatest. He was the biggest. He was the most. Adidas. He said, I'm the hardest working. He said, man, I give everything for Jesus Christ. But he said, uh, he said, I'm not suitable. I'm not me. I'm not suitable to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He was actually causing believers of that early era to die. He was seeing them put to prison. He was seeing them tortured so they would deny their faith, much like the Muslims do today. So he, he said, this was me. I'm not worthy of being called an apostle, but I am because God spoke to me. But by the grace of God, verse 10, I am what I am. His grace was bestowed on me, but it's not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I'm sure there were times that Paul would have quit. A lot of us as preachers, after we feel like we preach such a sorry sermon on Sunday, we want to quit. But uh, Monday, God puts us back in the traces. <laughs> and uh, we're pulling again. And, and, and so it should be. Uh, he said, I persecute, but God has put me where I am. Why am I here? Because God put me here. Uh, by the way, this was supposed to be my anniversary Sunday. Remember that, John? <laughs> he said, come, start preaching the first Sunday of April. And <laughs> preach every Sunday there and the plan of staying. And so, okay, we moved over there the mid mid March. Mm -hmm. We moved over home. He said, "Well, just move down here." And so we're going to start first Sunday of April. It didn't happen. <laughs> COVID threw a, a wrench in that. But we did start first Sunday of May. So next May, mm -hmm. uh, folks, you tolerate. You're a great grace. I mean, you've tolerated me a year almost now. But anyway, he uh, uh, said, "God called me, and I am what I am." And he said, "Now, I want to tell you something about the resurrection." The key message of the early apostles was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's alive. The tomb is empty. Uh, he's not there because he is alive and he has risen, as he has said. And uh, finally, the last, there's several reasons that the disciples did not manufacture the resurrection. One of them was they didn't even believe it was going to happen. Now think about it. They were shocked. They scared the daylights out of him when they were meeting in that upper room in Jerusalem and he appears, just comes through the wall and there he is. Now, the doors are locked, right? 
Who can walk in here? <laughs> Hopefully no one. <laughs> but the Lord came right through the wall. Now, if that doesn't scare the daylights out of somebody, what do you think somebody just come walking through and just appear through the wall here, huh? Mm -hmm. We'd be unlocking the door and making one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Wendy Bagwell said, he came from the church we belonged to many years ago, and they had that song about the snake handling church in, in somewhere, Holmes Arts, I think it was. And he says, uh, and asked the uh, elder there, Deacon, whatever, he said, uh, where's the back door? He said, there ain't one. He said, where do they want one? Yeah. <laughs> We had those snake animals come to Amarillo, and, and the guy put on the big thing at the Coliseum there, and uh, boy, he preached, and how he had faith, and all that. And I went on to Lubbock, did the same show and dance there, and I, that sounds sacrilegious, but I, so I kind of had to take it. A rattlesnake bit him in that service, and he died. He died. Well, there he got in the Well, I've got faith. Well, his faith wasn't enough to keep him alive. So, he gave that message to them, O ye of little faith. They didn't believe that he was going to be resurrected, even though he had told them over and over, I'm going to die, but the third day, I'll be up. I'll be out. They didn't believe it. They went to anoint his body that morning that they found the empty tomb. They're wondering how they're going to get that stone rolled back and so they can put the spices around him. He was already out of that tomb. At daybreak. He was up. He was up. And, and now, Paul deals with something. There were two main religions in the Jewish group of that day. We'd say today of our Christian day, there was two distinct groups of so-called Christians. There was two groups of the Jews. One was the Pharisees, and the other was the Sadducees. Now, I always was able to keep them apart because they, the, the Pharisees believed every Jot and tittle. That is every dot of the I and every cross of the T in the Word of God. Now, he said, because you know the Bible, you think you're going to heaven. But all of that scripture in the Old Testament point to me. And you will not come to me that you have life. We have people like that today. They, they go to church, they learn the Bible. Some of them are excellent preachers. I took a church in Amarillo that was pastored by a man. I mean, he was a tremendous preacher. He traveled and preached. Uh, in fact, that year of 52 Sundays, he was gone 26, and I preached in his place. He was that well-liked and known. He preached all over the South as a very popular preacher. It came out later. In fact, our church was in severe trouble because he wasn't paying the bills, and he was handling all of the money. Number two, when I was principal of the school, he would always take some young boys with him when he was going on an evangelistic trip. I didn't have, I was too naive. I mean, he's a creature of the gospel. He did not teach wrong teaching. He taught it as it says it in the Word of God. What he was doing, he was taking boys with him because he was a pedophile. And, uh, how can a man stand up and preach the word of God in truth and still be that? I mean, when I found out and later became the pastor of that church and it had scars like you wouldn't believe because of his doings. He went to Jackson, Mississippi and when I moved to Mississippi and I was traveling on the road and I would stop in that town on, on Wednesday night and go to church there. And then one Wednesday night, the preacher said, you recommended him to this church when we asked about him, and you never said anything about it. I said, I did not know. Now, sometimes we, we think we know somebody and find out, shockingly, we don't. So how could he do that? The Pharisees were that way. They had all of the truth they believed it as it was written, but they did not know that it pointed to Jesus. Now, they believed in resurrection. They believed in the miracles. They believed uh, all of those things that are critical to the Word of God. But you had the other group, the Sadducees. They were what we call liberals today. They did not believe in the resurrection. 
said they were Bible preachers in a sense, in, but they denied. It says in, they believed the truth, but in works they denied him. That's what Paul said to Timothy. There were those that, there were those that they believed. So they denied the resurrection. They denied miracles. And so Paul's evidently dealing with some of that in the past. He said, now then, let's deal with this. Now, if Christ be preached, verse 12 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection from the dead? Evidently, some of the people of, first, uh, of the Corinthian church there did not believe he bodily rose from the grave. They were like these liberals I listened to on that uh, uh, television thing by uh, on the resurrection by Tom Brokaw. There were many preachers that did not believe in the resurrection as we believe it and as the Bible teaches it. How can they say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, no, period, no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is still dead. He's still dead. He's not risen. He, somehow, and, and that's what those early Jews were trying to teach people, that he was stolen, his body was stolen, so that people would believe in the resurrection. But if Christ be not risen, then we're wasting time preaching. He says, then is our preaching vain in your faith also. If you believe that he rose from the dead and he didn't, you're either misguided or, or you're believing a, a wasted, you have a wasted faith. If I didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be here today. Because I believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And my preaching is not in vain if I exalt the Lord that raised from the grave. But he's saying now, if he didn't raise, our preaching is worthless. It's empty. The word vain means empty. It's nothing to it. And he said, your faith in God is nothing. Because God didn't raise him from the dead. He's still dead. You still don't have payment for your sin. You still do not have salvation. You do not have the grace. And so it goes verse 17. He said your faith is vain and you're still in your sins. So number one, uh, he, 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 if there's no resurrection, you have no Savior. And number two, if there's no resurrection, your salvation, you have no salvation. Your faith is empty. Third thing, if there's no resurrection, sin is still present in you. What's it say here, verse 17? If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you're still or yet in your sins. There's no payment for your sin. There's no way to pay for your sin. I was reading this week, a fellow attended, I think it's a Buddhist service uh, of a funeral. Somebody that was a Buddhist, uh, died, and, and he went to that funeral. And he said, there was nothing said. They all gathered around that, and a, they passed a mint out to each person. And they stood there looking at the, the, the graveside, or the person, I don't know whether they were lowered yet or what, how it was handled, but he said, they all gathered around that person, and they passed out mints, and they but that meant nothing was said. There was no preaching. There was no teaching. There was no singing. They just stood around that grave and sucked on that mint. The idea was when that mint was gone, it's over. They left. Again, nothing was said. They sucked that mint until it dissolved and then they left. Because that's the end. Folks, we don't want it to be the end. We see a lot of terrible injustice in America. And some people say, why doesn't God deal with this? Well, folks, God is going to deal with it. And He does deal with it. Sometimes presently, sometimes in the future. I know some people that severely disobeyed God. And uh, four men had lied and said they believed the truth of this Bible. And yet, four years later, they said, No, 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 we're not going to obey the Word of God. 
four of the seven men that were in that group that day that met with me died that year. Now, I didn't cause them to die. I moved on. I said, hey, if you don't believe it, I said, you've not just lied to me, you have lied to God. Now, you can't get by with lying to God, folks. That's just as simple as it is. Four men died. One of the leader, ringleader of that particular group, he was a uh, he was a sergeant on the police force. Dropped dead of a heart attack, unexpectedly. Three other men died quickly and unexpectedly like that. They were in that group. I don't. I, I didn't wish it on. I didn't pray for their death. I just said, "Hey, you've lied to God. I'm out of here," and I left. Now, if they did not ever get right. If there's no accountability for them, then it's all right. If there's no accountability for sin and crime, go out and kill whatever you don't like. Go out and steal from those that you can get by with from. Doesn't matter. There's no accountability. Oh, well, there's some groups that would try to hold you accountable. But Basically, in America, we have gotten to the point where there's no accountability for criminal activity. Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, we see it every day. Amen. So if there's no accountability, our faith is in vain. Just do the best you can. Get by with whatever you can get by with because it doesn't matter. And that's what Paul said. But if there is a resurrection, and there is, and you sin... There's a payday someday. They have in Jezebel. Uh, old, old Elijah said there's a payday. I remember hearing Robert G. Lee preach that message, payday someday, all over the United States, and I heard him preach it in person. And, and uh, he said, you know, uh, and he was so descriptive, but that's a payday someday. No, these people won't get by with denying God. They won't get by with having a prayer to the uh, 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 as, as they did to open the, the Congress this time, uh, our God, our Father, our Mother, our folks, everything that denies that they had the pledge of allegiance and left under God out. They leave God out, and you think they're getting by with it? No, no, they're not getting by with it. He said they're still in their sin, and sin has a payday. And he said, then the sad thing is those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, verse 18, they're falling asleep. They die. And they're just, that's it. They're just perished. So if there's no resurrection, believers who die are gone. Or if there is a place reserved for the ungodly, they're in hell. Because there's no escape without Jesus Christ. But, and I love this, God says there in the last few verses of that chapter, there's victory. There's victory. Victory over the world. He says, because he rose, we can believe in our own resurrection one day. Now, I don't know whether I'll go through the grave or through the air, but I will meet the Lord one day. And I, a preacher said years ago, I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the upper taker. Now, that brother that said that, he went through the undertaker, he went to, <laughs> by the way of the grave. We may or may not. But folks, I'm going to tell you, there's people that try to predict a day when Jesus comes. We don't know. Some preacher starts that, that well, I, I tell you what, I, I can't tell you the exact day and hour, but I'll tell you what month and year it is. He's a fool. There was a preacher who came across the country back when I was in Amarillo that claimed that, oh, uh, we know that he's going to come on, uh, what it was, July 4th, uh, 1976, I think it was. And he preached that all over the country. My church said, Brother Ross, what do you think about that? I said, well, I'll tell you what, God's going to make a fool out of him because anybody that makes claims like that, God, if he planned that day, he would change it just to make a fool out of him. Because show them they don't know what they're talking about. Because he told them they don't know. And so 
He says, but Christ became the first fruits of them that slept, those that died. And by man came death. By man's sin came death. By man also, and that man was Jesus Christ. Man was Jesus Christ came the resurrection of the dead. In Adam all die. In Christ, those who have faith will be made alive. Everyone in his order, Christ, and then those that are, are his at his coming. So, then comes the end, and, and, and shall have delivered up the kingdom of the Father, and they put down all rule, authority, and power. All false religion, all false government, all false uh, beliefs will be put down. Jesus Christ will reign. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. There will be a time when nobody will die. Now, uh, we've lost loved ones just recently that have gone on, gone, uh, passed on. Others have passed on since I've been here in this year. People have died. I don't know whether I'm going to die or not. You don't know whether you're going to die or not. We may be, though, in that day when the Lord says, come up, come on home. And he said, the last enemy destroyed death. He put all things on his feet. Then he goes on down and said that uh, uh, although you even have suffered great sufferings, that uh, you will one day have the victory. So there's a transformation in verses 40 through 50 uh, of how he's going to change the body. And he gives the example of a seed. You ever put a seed? Years ago, when I was in elementary school, they had us take a glass of water and we, we put a cardboard or something around it and stuck a seed. And you put that seed and you watch that seed germinate and become whatever it was. Grow. Put up leaves. I think it was a bean seed or a pea seed, whatever it was and that. But hey, it came to life and grew. And I, I watched these little old doves out here. Uh, we've got two more that's uh, made it home with us, so they're right underneath the deck. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they'll have one or two uh, babies, and uh, that they'll, they'll help break that egg open, and then those little ones come out. And, and in 14 days, they're gone. I said, can't believe anything grow that fast and gone. You think your grandkids grow that fast. But it's up and gone. So God uses the seed. That seed is not the final thing, but out of that seed comes that life. Without that seed, dying and decaying, there would not be a new plant. And that's what he's saying here in this passage. So it is, we are not finished. God says he's not finished with us yet. And said, so if, if, if it doesn't come alive, then it, it will die. And so he said, same with our bodies. These old bodies, we're going to give them up. What kind of body do we have? We talk about in, in the resurrection and, and the rapture, that uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain at that moment will be caught up together with them there. Somebody said, well, why did they come up first? And somebody said, well, they got six foot further to go. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be so fast it won't matter. Amen. Be caught up to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be. And so <clears throat> God's going to transform our body. That body that comes out of the grave is not going to be the body that enters into heaven. He's going to give us a new body. Maybe you remember that old song. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Huh? Well, I won't be plagued by, uh, you know, I've got, you know, false ears and false teeth and whatever else. So, uh, you know, uh, my, my sister, older sister, had a false heart. She had one made out of a pig. I mean, a valve anyway. Uh, so it won't be the same. won't be all the end of that. God will give us a new body. But God, verse 38, gives us a body as it pleased him. And every seed his own body. This flesh is not the flesh that will enter into heaven. And so he goes on to tell us, though, of the rapture. Going down in verse 51, I'll close with this. Uh, that great hope we have is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he came out of that grave, he said, we have hope that we can come out of the grave if we go to the grave. Verse 51 said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now remember this whole passage. Falling asleep is a believer dying. 
We'll not all die. But we shall all be changed. Amen. Amen. Huh? Amen. What a... Uh, are you satisfied with your body? <laughs> well, if you are, you're still young. <laughs> no. <laughs> Most of... Uh, uh, the, minute you, the minute you're born, you begin to die. It's just that cell replacement happens faster than the decaying of the other cells. But it gets to a point in life that goes that way. <laughs> you can't keep the body functioning good. But he said we will be changed. Well, this corruptible, this body that can decay, this body that can rot, this body that can totally become dust, will put on incorruption. We'll put on a new body. And mortal, a person that's able to die, will put on immortality. We'll become someone who will never die again. And this corrupter will put on incorruption. This mortal shall put in on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass that which is written. written. Death is swallowed up in victory. One day we'll say, bye-bye, death. You didn't make it. You didn't want to be able to hold us. Huh? Just as Jesus laughed in the face of death, hell, and the grave, and and emptied that tomb. One day we'll empty the grave. Or, uh, somebody said, well, what about if you're cremated? I, I know people preach, well, don't ever, use, uh, don't ever cremate a Christian. Why? Do you think this body's going to go to glory? Do you think God, I've, I've known people that they sprinkle their ashes to the ocean. I participate in some of those services. Well, can they be brought together? Be brought to heaven? You know. By the way, the majority of poor people in the day of Christ were born on funeral piers. They call them. They were stacks of wood, and they were born uh, 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 born up of flame and burned up of flame. Uh, they had cremation in the day of Christ. Did those believers die in vain? No. No. God will give each of us a new body, and we'll be able to say. Oh, where's your sting, death? Hey, you thought you had the victory. Where's your victory now? And you'll kiss death goodbye and go on him in the air. Thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you go to the grave, you'll still go to meet him in the air. If you don't go to the grave and we're still here, what would that be something to have a... I, I, we'd be here on a Sunday morning and all of a sudden, the rapture come and we're gone. Woo Somebody said, you know, it'd be spooky in a church service. All of a sudden, now think about it. Am I going to take my false teeth with me? No. Will I take my hearing aids with me? No. Will I take these clothes with me? No. No. Hmm? Just think about it. All them artificial body parts, maybe somebody has to replace knees, replace hips. That old, uh, whatever that is, that, I, I, that I've had family members had both hips replaced and knees replaced. Uh, one's had a shoulder replaced. One had a foot replaced. What? <laughs> There's even a piece of plastic left, or two or three pieces of plastic left. <laughs> Can you imagine being in the service and not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? All of a sudden, everybody disappears, and here's a pile of worn clothes. Here's eyeglasses, here's hearing aids, here's false teeth, here's false body parts. Amen. Hallelujah. They stay, but we're gone. We're gone. Hallelujah. Huh? Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. All because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us, for giving your son to die for us. And for proving you accepted his payment for our sins, he rose from the grave as a guarantee. Amen. As he rose, we one day will rise. Thank you for that, Father. Now, if there's somebody here today that's not saved, if that rapture would come today, they'd be left behind. What a terrifying moment that should be when somebody sees a believer just disappear. And the remnants of their bodies and clothes and all be left behind. Would they gone? Father, I pray that person would sound and trust you, believe in you, and know that because you live, we will live also. Help me to make that trust in you. Oh Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Thank you for paying for my 
my sins on the cross. I thank you for proving that that payment was sufficient by coming out of that grave and that first resurrection, first resurrection night. Jesus' name. Are you here today? Are you trusting him? Are you believing in him? If you're not, would you raise your hand? Let's just have a word of prayer. Just a moment. Father,